the Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Welcome to it. Weekend editions here at Tail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Check Dead by your friends at Currency. Almost fumbled at the goal line. <laughs> we regathered the uh, the handoff. It's a loss of two, but we're we're off and running this morning. Hail Varsity Radio Weekend, presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, and Elijah. Herbal. Numbers to get in this morning can dial us up at 466-376-466-37-76-800-825-5865. can find us and watch us this morning, if you dare, on ESPN Lincoln's Facebook, on ESPN Lincoln's Twitter, and on Hale Varsity's Radio Twitter feed at H Varsity Radio. Elijah's got his big old cup of coffee. Uh, we had a successful uh, homecoming last night for Junior. He was in bed way before I was. Uh, the parents had a good time last night. Uh, he is downstairs, but he made a a, a late night taco run. Apparently, uh, so that's. Uh, Quite impressive, a man after Elijah Herbal's heart with the uh, the uh, the taco run late. We are efforting Mark Cranach. He is checking his headset, P. Diddy style, right now. And uh, Elijah, what do you know, man? How's the uh, how was the night? We had a fun time at the Hale Varsity Club yesterday. You, uh, yeah, you're uh, <laughs> you're like, yay, I'm here. Mark Cranach joins us. Cranach, good Friday night. You ready for your bye Saturday, my friend? Mm, I don't think Mark can hear us still. Mm. He looks inquisitive right now with his computer. <laughs> He's flat out annoyed. Everything's here's what's great. Co- yep, here's what's coming up this morning. We will rewind and uh, get uh, some national perspective with a guy that uh, was uh, in the metro region for a number of years. Uh, does a great job with uh, with the SEC and the ACC network. Matt Schick will join us. Of course, you catch him and Nick Baugh with the Schick and Nick podcast with Heard at Media. So Matt Schick coming up around 7.30 or so, or rewind with him. In hour two, we'll uh, make sure we spend time with Brandon Vogel. Excited to get his take on the week. And then the Iron Horse, Gary Sharp, will be with us. So uh, that's on the docket. It's been an interesting week. Uh, In the bye week is supposed to be a a week of rejuvenation, uh, a chance to heal up, get healthy, even though it's early, early in the season. And uh, Nebraska football, Nebraska's fan base, absolutely needs a bye week. Uh, It's been... Uh, anything but a smooth season. The dismissal of Frost, the dismissal of Chenander after Oklahoma, and uh, and then you move forward here with some um, changes, uh, not only contractually, but uh, you also have a full week of recruiting. What do we got going here with Cranach? Uh I have just reached out to Mark via text. I have no idea what's going on right now. So uh, as soon as I know, you'll you'll be the the first to know. But uh, mm-hmm. couldn't tell you. <laughs> You can email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. It's worked last week. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Is is something burning in the studio? Why are we off air? Uh, yeah, that was uh, – well, really, I got no idea. I'm, gonna go shut, I'm just going to shut the alarm off. Just It'll be good. Everything's going great on the Saturday morning. Yeah, let's just – we, we needed to buy today. But uh, we don't have one. So we're off and going. Uh, Trev Alberts, of course, meeting uh, with the media on Thursday. He had uh, some comments not only about the, uh, the the names that are floating out there about the coaching job, 
but uh, you had Mitch Sherman report what amendments have been made to Mickey Joseph. And uh, when it comes to Mickey Joseph, his uh, contract is is much better right now. His base still six hundred thousand dollars, a monthly stipend of uh, thirty three thousand dollars and change, uh, taking on this role as the interim head coach. Uh, and uh, the thing that is good that's helping Mickey this week on the recruiting trail is that he can say, yes, I will be here. Because if Mickey does not get the job as head coach at Nebraska, Mickey uh, will be able to transition back to wide receivers coach. He'll be able to transition back to associate head coach. And uh, that is extremely key for uh, Nebraska, for Nebraska's recruits. And uh, you know that he is, going to be uh, in Lincoln, uh, whether or not he gets the interim tag removed. That's important. Nebraska's got to move forward. Uh, Bill Bush taking over a larger role, moving from special teams coordinator. Uh, Bill Bush now is your defensive coordinator. And Elijah, I think the the thing with Nebraska is as you look forward to next week in Indiana and the rest of the season, you still have eight games left. Uh, you're going to need the offensive line play to improve vastly, but you're going to need the defense to make some jumps and not just a little bit, a lot. And there'll be incremental jumps, and that started with some fundamental work for Nebraska football a little bit during this week before they start prepping for Indiana. But uh, with Bill Bush, I think, you know, there's there's a belief out there that uh, with – Coach Chenander, uh, in some instances, I think he tried to match what the call was going to be for an offense with a specific defense, right? And and last year, you could do that. You did do that because you had Daniels plugging up the middle. You had Stilly uh, plugging up the middle. And you also had uh, a really talented secondary that had been back there with uh, Dismuke and Williams that had been back there for years, right? I mean, you're talking super seniors along with Cam Taylor Britt at the corner. Nebraska's defense was good enough to win a lot of ball games last year. You go into this year with the same philosophy, and you've got too many new pieces either that have been in the program or too many new pieces that were added in the portal. And I think uh, from a gelling standpoint and a familiarity standpoint, it was a lot to ask, Bud, uh, for this defense. And you've seen the results. You've seen 35 points a ball game. Uh, You've seen uh, over 500 yards. You've been gashed uh, on the, uh, the defensive side of the ball. So can simplification be a reality for Nebraska football moving forward here? Uh, Can they, get their calls down can they simplify and have fewer checks right uh and if you can't do your assignment and get the alignment down you're uh, you're in a lot of trouble and you, you saw that last week against oklahoma case in point not only because of oklahoma's tempo and talent level but you've seen nebraska struggle to get lined up uh quite often uh, this season not only in dublin but you saw it at times against North Dakota. You for sure saw it against Georgia Southern. And then Oklahoma was going so fast it really didn't matter uh, whether you knew what they were doing or not. So we have Mark Cranack with us. Mark Cranack, we're, ta- we're well, talking about – Was your about- site muted? Was that the problem? How does that even happen? I mean, and we don't have to get into, like, Chrome and coding and all that. But I'm, I'm logged. Everything else is working fine. The headphones are good. Mm-hmm. I'm hearing – audio on all kinds of applications except this one and then he's like hey is the site muted i'm like i I didn't do that maybe it is and i go and and it was the site was muted so here we are facial expressions were were priceless they they (laughs) reminisced many in memorial stadium after the first five minutes last saturday mark cranack joins us now cranack we're we're diving in a little bit here to the week that's been coach chin's dismissed Uh, of course, Mickey getting a little that bit of a That seems like bump. months ago. That seems like months ago. Yeah, this week yeah. has been uh, necessary, but we 
Despite yeah. our start today, we are going to finish a, a four-quarter ball game strong. Mm. But I got well, in. That's a how little... we're built. This is. I mean, this is what we've done all that training for. Uh, right, so, right. Yeah, we um, start. We should, no, we just got to. We just got to lock back into fundamentals here, and and right. the, the results will take care of themselves. <laughs> right. Do complimentary um, radio. That's what <laughs> <we're doing>. <laughs> <laughs> Matt yeah. Schick with us in about uh, fifteen minutes. Our rewind. So he's not funny or anything. I, yeah, defensive line and linebackers and safeties, Cranach. I think you're going to have simplification. Can this defense be complementary here moving forward? I think the offense had a, a, a bad day against Oklahoma. That'll happen. But overall, you're going to need the defense to, to be much, much better. And yeah. how soon is now going to be for that defense? You've got a bye week to work. you got a bye week to get better at tackling. But you, you also have a bye week to get guys that – uh, need to keep a job, uh, win their spot again, or deal with some more growing pains if you go with the youth movement. But Bill Bush, it sounds like, is going to try and simplify. Well, that would be fine. Uh, you, you also have to figure out, so yes, yeah, there, there's the scheme, and then there's the calls, and then there's the personnel, then there's how they play together. But as much as anything, man, the, the thing that I saw lacking, yes, tackling. That's part yep. of it. But it's general mentality. Yep. I mean, you had – there were shades of Mike Riley era, Lamar Jackson. 2017, yeah. Out there on the edge. And, dude, I mean, you cannot play any level of football with that sort of – you don't even call it effort as much as it's just like – do you even like – like, you know, this is a contact sport, right? Like, this is mm-hmm. – like you have to take on contact, and a lot even of business that guy decisions. What you're telling me? Yeah, even though that guy that's running is like pretty big and strong, the reason you're on scholarship is to bring him down, and that's why you, you've been working out for the last like <laughs> long while. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were enough guys on enough, play, especially that long quarterback run. Yeah, where dudes were just waiting for the other person to make the tackle. There, there were probably three of them on that one play where they're waiting for somebody else to do it. Not just waiting, but just sort of like assuming it will happen as opposed to being like, hey, I'm in the vicinity. I have pads. That dude has the ball and is advancing it. I should stop that. Like that mentality is not in there right now for some of the guys that are playing. You can't play those dudes. And if that's the best you have, Wow, that's good. But but I refuse to believe. Urban Meyer said this too. Me and Urban, pretty similar. In our <laughs> well, of course. Thoughts and assessments. Uh, he, you both would have had a great time in Dublin. He said essentially something like, "You know, I refuse to believe that they don't have somebody on that. I mean, you got a roster of one fifty. Mm-hmm. There's not a couple dudes on there that can just go ahead and make those tackles like." I, it it was rough, man. It, and it and it's uh, it's something where you wonder, and something Joel Klatt said too, which I thought was pretty telling, where he said, uh, you know, they, it's not that they have a bad culture, it's not that they have a good culture, it's that they have no culture. Yeah. Like, and and he highlighted how transient Nebraska his roster has been, which has been a concern we've talked about for a while. Like, okay, you've gone the mercenary route now. Right, you brought in all these. There's only two seniors on the team. You bring in all these mercenaries. When the things don't go well, do they have enough sort of shared trust and like camaraderie to kind of band together and back each other up, or do they start just kind of, eh? What are you, you playing know, for? Out? Right, right. I mean, it's you just, or dude, your it's, brother. It, and the more the more you see it happen, the more you know that in the last year or so I, I don't know all the details everybody's heard the rumors of course you know of what frost was or wasn't doing and mm-hmm. what meetings he was or wasn't attending or whatever uh but it doesn't appear that there has been much accountability mm-hmm. in any way shape or form um it's it's bad and but it's a mental it's a it's a mentality thing i i believe more than anything else uh I, I, scheme is one thing, yes. Like 
you know, sh- should safeties 12 yards off the ball be filling run gaps against Georgia? Probably not, right? Like, of course that stuff matters. But, man, I, I just saw enough opportunities where guys are in the vicinity to make a play and just flat out don't try <laughs> to do it. And you're like, you can't, I mean, call whatever play you want defensively. Do whatever alignment you want defensively. Dudes like that can't be on the field, just nope. period. Well, and you got to wonder, too, that, all right, you, you've had enough time to come to Jesus here with film review. You've had enough or time Allah, to – whatever you're into. To, you to, to coach up, and you've got to make a move forward with every, everything on the table open, yeah. all positions, and the, this is critical for – leadership whether you're one of the the few seniors or somebody that a voice that's listened to in the locker room to your point about guys turning down the opportunity to make a tackle on that scramble thinking someone else is going to do it yep you you as a guy like Nelson right or or Newsom or Tanner Vocalek right you have got to yeah, your captain's got to be stepping forward and trusted enough because those guys didn't play perfect ball either. But they've got to be at least listened to and, and, and fix this. And guys got to be okay with continuing to work to, to keep their spot. Uh, there's no tenure. I mean, that's that uh, keeps ringing through my ears with Trev Alberts. There's no tenure in coaching. No, there's no tenure in positions either. So if you're going to go with a redshirt freshman or someone that's new in the program because they're hungry and they give you the best chance to win, there might be a little bump. Can it be any worse? As Clark Griswold once said, we're at the threshold of hell, right? I mean, that's what it's looking like on defense, as Mm -hmm. is. (laughs) Can it get much worse? So, ooh, they're they're putting up 550 and, and 50 a game? Oh, well, I mean, you're allowing 35, right? And so at what point do you eject the old guard and come in with the new guard? That'll be pretty telling. Uh, this week will, to me, have been telling. And then what do they move forward with uh, next week during practice and Indiana prep? Because there's still, there's still opportunity out there. And I think a lot of Nebraska fans feel that the season is lost already, right? Uh, That's what but, it looks like. But 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 what, there's still you know. there's still eight games, so yeah. Uh, well, it technically isn't lost yet. You still have opportunity. Of, of course, and you know, what it, are you doing? It, it was it was also very good to hear Mickey Joseph echo what I think we've also been talking about on this show, which is it, it's good to hear it out loud because I've been waiting to hear it for like a decade now, mm-hmm. um, where instead of talking about, well, no, we had the right plate, we just didn't execute, or ah, we got to do a better job of executing. It's like, no, what about your job as a coach to play complementary football mm-hmm. and to realize the situation you're in, right? So when, when it's v- v- abundantly clear to people just sitting on their couch that you cannot pass protect for crap, <laughs> like, you just can't. Like, you can lament it all you want, you could say, ah, oh, they better execute better, but they're not. So, so, what do you do? I don't know. Maybe stop doing putting them in positions to do something that they're terrible at, right? And if that means taking the air out of the ball and committing to just running it no matter what and then trying to hit some play action and maybe having kind of a crappy offensive performance, but it milks clock keeps your defense off the field, things like that, it's probably worth doing, mm-hmm. right? And, and Mickey talked about that. He's, you know, in hindsight, I, shouldn't, I should, have, should have done that because they could yep. not protect, right? No. You're, 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 it's, not, it's not only that you can't protect so you can't throw the ball downfield. It's that you are going to get your quarterback injured mm-hmm. because people are taking free shots at the guy. And, you know, and to, unless you can fix that mid-game – you got to recognize the game you're in and just be like, okay, that's not going to work today. Uh, 
let's 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 pack it in a little bit. Let's give our our team the best chance to win a game versus here is the play that looks good in chalk. Here's the play that, based on their coverage, looks like it should be open. Great, but you're not accounting for the fact that your tackle's not blocking anybody. So <laughs> that you know that play no longer works. Rip it um, out and burn it. <clears throat> right. It's, Here's so, the other it, thing. It's good to hear Mickey do it. We'll see if he actually does it in the next game. What, what, what can you gauge from your team as you've gone good on good? Because if the defense is where they're at and your offense can line up and, and this our offense does this well against this defense, let's put it in for the game plan. Well, nine times out of ten, you're going to be facing better defenses than you're, you're going against in scout, right? Oh, geez. So how do you yeah. even put a plan together? Because <laughs> Nebraska's game plan early against Oklahoma looked good. That was a great script. Six plays, 77 yards. Uh, the next yeah. 37 plays, 77 yards, right? Because OU yeah. overloaded and got home and played pinata with the quarterback. You had countless negative runs to try and set the run game up on first down to make second and manageable. You're going backwards, uh, at least four consecutive drives. It's second and long because you got nothing on first down. Your quarterback got, quarterback got murdered. Uh, your short game didn't go anywhere because all the bubble plays that worked in that first drive, oh, you put press coverage out there, threw away your blockers, and made tackles there. Yeah. And the the routes were too long to develop, and there was no time for Casey Thompson. I did like Chubba Purdy. Thought he looked good. Uh, yeah. That was encouraging. Um, you have a situation, too, where A.J. Allen's hurt. What's Nebraska get at running back? Uh, Weekend edition moves forward here, presented by Currency. And our conversation here, the weekend rewind with Matt Schicks on the way. Now it's time to get back to the Hale Varsity Radio Show with Chris Schmidt and Mark Cranach. All right, that's it. You two guys leave me no choice. No television for a week. What? Back into it at Tower 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. And the joys of Nebraska football at this point in time, the man that's on ESPN Radio, Sirius XM, and, of course, the Hurt Ad Family Podcast, uh, the Schick and Nick Show, Matt Schick with us at ESPN underscore Schick. And, Matt, uh, on your Twitter bio, it says... Uh, I move you ahead to action due to time constraints. Could you not have done that for uh, for Nebraska fans to save them some uh, some anguish after the first five minutes? Thanks for the time, man. Good to spend uh, a few minutes with you. Yeah, you as well. I, I probably would have been good, you know, if I was if I freelanced for Fox, I could have done that uh, during the onside kick. I guess oh. Northwestern, <laughs> and then uh, maybe a little Big Ten Network action. Uh, with Georgia Southern, I think would have been more than appropriate. Yeah, there were there was a lot of uh, a lot of different times where maybe we could fast forward, and perhaps maybe we could fast forward to like year two of the next head coach. Maybe that's the way to do it. That that would work well. Matt Schick with us here on Hale Varsity. Oh, uh, it's been an interesting uh, well season uh, so far. It's it's felt like uh, two or three seasons put together, and and, and the bye week is here. But I want to go back and to to touch on Frost and his tenure here. Was there a point you were out or, okay, you'd seen enough, not not to call for a firing per se, but just, all right, I've made my call. This isn't going to work. Was there an eject moment for you? Uh, I kept giving him the benefit of the doubt until Ireland, mm-hmm. until what happened there, because – Everyone knew what was riding on that game. Everybody knew what was at stake, and no one more so than him. And it was pretty clear that um, he wanted to take matters into his own hands. I, I'm not sure how you have a a second half so different from a first half, uh, and a final quarter and a half so different from the first two and a half. That it was just, um, you know, it started with the onside kick. I mean, even though the analytics tell you a certain thing. I remember going on the 
the chicken Nick pod uh, that you mentioned and just saying, look, if you're not calling the plays and you're, and you're making decisions that cost you games, then what good are you? And that's not to disrespect him. It's just to state the facts of you were brought in for a reason. And that reason now you've passed to another person, you know, calling plays and acumen. And now you're going to be the CEO and you're going to oversee things. And then when you do that and you, and you decide to make a decision that, uh, frankly, was just silly, um, like you're, you know, you're gambling with other people's money at that point, when in reality he's been broke and he's in debt. And you have to, you know, when you don't have money, you can't be spending others. And that's what he was doing there. And then, um, you know, North Dakota, I kind of gave him the benefit of the doubt, though, because of the time change. And, you know, it's the next week you never buy like Northwestern. And then obviously what happened with Georgia Southern was enough for everybody. But there should it's, it's one of those things, Schmitty, like in hindsight, you look back, you're okay. You always assume the law of averages would kick in mm-hmm. in these close games. And then you realize, well, going into this year, the common denominator was still the same. And so if it went the same way, you knew why. And now we know why. Mickey Joseph has taken over, and uh, he is about accountability. Had his presser today, even during a bye week. And uh, he relieved Coach Chenander on Sunday. Uh, things weren't adding up, to paraphrase Mickey. I didn't think the defense was going to get better. He's familiar with Bill Bush. What's your outlook moving forward? There's eight games left. I don't know what the friends in the desert are going to say about point spreads, and I know that November's pretty evil if, if you're in Nebraska, and they just don't look competent on both lines of scrimmage right now. Yeah, and frankly, I don't know what it matters. Um, I, I guess that's kind of where I'm, mm-hmm. where you're at with it. I don't mean to be cynical uh, about it, but as the 30,000-foot view, whether they go – uh, five and seven or two and ten, who cares? Uh, and I and I know Husker fans care. I know you want to put a good product on the field, but this thing is going to get blown up. Um, there are going to be new coaches coming in. They're going to be starting from scratch. Um, I will tell you that ESPN's football power index uh, indicates that they will win one more game. The percentages also said before the season that they'd be eight and four. So. You know, you can take some of these things with a grain of salt, but they do adapt to how teams have gotten better and how teams have gotten worse and where they are metrically. And they are favored in one more game this year, and that's the next game, October 1st, against Indiana. They are percentage underdogs um, in every single game the rest of the way. In fact, the best chance they have to win a game is against Illinois, outside of the Indiana game, is Illinois on October 29th, they have a 55% chance to win, according to the Football Power Index. Again, just numbers to throw around, but it's the same thing bookies use, uh, those power numbers. Um, but I, it, it doesn't seem like this will get much better, and I think the one saving grace that you have is that you have a coach and a staff that is trying to save their own jobs. Um, if they knew they didn't have a shot at that, this could really get bad. Uh, but there is a shot with, you know, people are, are saying, hey, you know, we've, we've got eight more games to, to try and figure this out, and, and hopefully they can. But I'm highly skeptical because of the instability there and the stability in every other program that they're going to face. Matt Schick is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Matt, I want you to go back a couple of months. I know we have the benefit of hindsight now, but – can we go back and evaluate Trev's decision to bring back Scott for another season after hearing what's been coming out of the woodwork, not all of it confirmed, but uh, just a lot of stuff coming uh, out of the woodwork about what was going on behind the scenes with with Husker football. Do you want to go back and and take a look at Trev's decision to keep Scott Frost around for another season, even though he'd be let go after three games? No, I don't because I think things had to get worse for him to to pull the trigger in that way. Um, because it, it, even though I'm far away from it, you know, I still feel like I have a gauge on how fans feel. And I felt like it was pretty split. And I don't think it can be 50-50 or 60-40 in favor of firing him for you to fire a guy like Scott Frost. Um, you know, you go back to 
you know, and Tom Osborne was brought on board to reunite the fan base. I mean, things get pretty fragile around there and get, can get pretty tenuous. And so for a guy in Trev Alberts, remember, at that time had been on the job for six months. And for a guy to come in and say, all right, I've seen enough after six months, when in reality he just got there, I think would send, would send the wrong message, not only because of who you're firing, but the timing of the firing. And so I think, if anything, it shows, hey, I was willing to do whatever I could to help. And I think the brochure Trev can lay out to an ex-head coach is, you will have my unequivocal support, and anything you need I will give you. And he made a point of saying that, at the news conference when he announced Frost firing is, I did everything I could. We wanted nothing but for him to succeed and get, did everything we could to help. And that's also the message to the next head coach is we're all in line. We all want the same thing. It just didn't work. And no one wanted Scott Frost to be fired until he had to be. And, you know, maybe those internally maybe wanted him out a little bit sooner because they knew exactly what was going on. Uh, but no one knew more of what was going on than Frost. And no one knew, you would think, how to fix it more than Frost. And he couldn't get out of his own way. And you know, whether it was on or off the field, Scott Frost simply couldn't get out of his own way. And my, my initial reaction is Trev Alberts almost had to wait for him to get into his own way uh, in order to make it pretty obvious for everyone. Few minutes here, Matt Schick with us, ESPN uh, Radio, ESPN Sirius XM. And uh, TV at ESPN underscore Schick on Twitter. And, of course, host with Nick, uh, the Schick and Nick show on Herd Ad Media. Their podcast, uh, a must-listen to. And, uh, Matt, I want to get a thought from the, the, the Nebraska job, right? You've got Nebraska open. Herm got let go at Arizona State. Again, with your, uh, your, your national perspective, you've also been, uh, been in Nebraska for a few years with your career. What's the, uh, the the job uh, level like in Lincoln? What's what's the Nebraska job now uh, to to folks at your level? What's um, what's the uh, the draw for for a potential candidate? Well, the the draw will be that the bar is pretty low, which is good. Um, following in the footsteps of Osborne and Solich was not going to be easy when nine wins wasn't good enough. And frankly, following the footsteps of Bo Mm -hmm. wasn't going to be easy when nine wins isn't good enough. Uh, But now a bowl game is good enough. So I I think the the good news about the last five-plus years, six, seven years with Riley and now Frost, is that it forces fans to recalibrate maybe not your goals but your expectations, and those are two different things. And so for a head coach to come in here – to understand that, hey, I'm going to get paid a lot of money, which is a good thing, and you're going to have to pay me a lot of money to coach this program because it's going to take a lot of work, uh, but to also get paid a lot of money to not have to win the Big Ten, or at least right away. right? To not, there's going to be time. And you know, I, I've said the draw is going to be money. I mean, that, that's going to be the first thing. So when we see Arizona State is open, that was a, an unmitigated disaster. And if someone wants to work for Ray Anderson, who was thinking so outside the box and was the smartest guy in the room that he hires Herm Edwards, who hadn't coached college football in how long and thought they were going to reinvent the wheel in Arizona State, and it turned into a mess, if you want to go work for him, if he's got your say, then God bless you. But if it's a choice of bosses, I don't know if there's a bigger draw than to say, I'm going to work for Trev Alberts. And Trev Alberts, you'll have his support. He'll, he'll run interference for you. He's your CEO if you need him. And he's as good of a dude as you'll find in the business um, in terms of knowing what's right and wrong and how he wants to go about doing things. So for a guy who competed for national championships, he sure seems to have a level head about what the expectations are. So the number one job, the number one draw is money. The number two draw is working for Trev Alberts. The number three draw is understanding that if you can win six, seven, eight games annually, they might build a statue for you. Matt, let's get into some of the, the names out there and uh, 
Trev, once upon a time, said you're pretty good at asking questions, if memory serves. <laughs> so, he did. He so, did. so I'm going to say Trev's got your number and he's calling you because he's going to call a lot of people. Yeah. Let's just play this game. Give me Matt's. Yeah. Give me Matt's uh, top three. Yeah, my top three uh, initially, as soon as he was fired, without talking to anybody, was Campbell, Leipold, and Kleiman. Mm-hmm. Simply because of the footprint and because of the track record of success, not only winning national championships and or winning a major New Year's Six bowl game, which I think is where Nebraska wants to be, is, mm-hmm. is getting to that bowl game level where you can compete at a high level. And um, so those three have done it, and those three have done it recruiting to really challenging places. Um, if you look at what Lance Leipold is doing right now, and I don't want to be a prisoner of the moment. Oh, look, they're 3-0. and But you can't argue with the, with the results. And right now, Jalen Daniels is metrically the best quarterback in college football. And he plays for Kansas. And they just beat Houston and West Virginia, two Power 5 programs. Well, Power 6, Power 5. Mm-hmm. Um, but to think about where that program was at, I mean, Texas just went toe-to-toe with Alabama, and it was only – 10 months ago that Kansas went into Texas and beat them. I mean, those kind of things matter. And Kansas is a terrible job. So if you can pull a guy that is doing a good job at a terrible job, and you're going to give him resources, um, that that to me says a lot. So I I think Leipold's up there. And I also think it's important to find a guy where, yeah, maybe you catch lightning in a bottle, but he kept, Trev kept using the word grinder. Mm-hmm. I mean, is there any more evidence of wanting to grind than being the head coach at Kansas and then doing a good job at it? So there's a grinder. Um, and I also think it's important to find a guy who, if he's good at it, isn't going to be looking for another job. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, would be a Lance Leipold. I mean, Trev, Trev looks at stability and emphasizes that. Um, and has said that time and again. So I would go Leipold and, and, and Campbell, 1A, 1B, however you want to look at it. And winning in the line of scrimmage, I think, suits Campbell um, as well. So I think either one of those guys might. I would lean Campbell simply because he's won at the Power 5 level mm-hmm. um, and, and won a New Year's 6. But uh, I don't think you can go wrong. I don't think Kleiman would take it. I think he's too happy uh, from everyone I talked to at Kansas State. Loves his job, and he's, he's not going to mess with happy. But you've been at a place like Iowa State long enough. And uh, like I said, Big Ten money is different than Big 12 money. And I think that's why you target those two guys. A few minutes here, Matt Schick with us, ESPN uh, Radio, ESPN Sirius XM, and uh, TV at ESPN underscore Schick on Twitter. And, of course, host with Nick, uh, the Schick and Nick show on Herd Ad Media. Kansas, to, back to Lance, I mean, he they just look different, right? And I think the mess mm-hmm. he walked into – post Les Miles, there may have been a player or two there, you know, because Les could always recruit, but th- just what they do on the lines of scrimmage as quickly as they've done it, uh, quarterback aside, and he's phenomenal, you're right, but they're just pretty much bullies on the lines, and I didn't think I'd say that about Kansas football, you know, ever again post uh, post 30 years ago, you know, uh, so what he's done down there is pretty impressive, and I know that there's some fatigue with the Nebraska tie or the Nebraska guy, but it doesn't hurt that there's been some mentorship by some really good people from Nebraska when, when Leopold was, was in Lincoln. Uh, yeah. He, he gets, I think all, he gets I think it a little all that bit. matters in, in being familiar with the area, being yeah. the, the familiarity with Nebraska. You don't have to know the state inside and out. You don't have to have been employed at the university to get it, but, it helps. It's not one of those reasons that you hire someone, right. but it sure is a nice thing. It's like, hey, I didn't buy that house because it has the in-ground pool, but it's nice. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a good added bonus. I bought it because it's in a great city and a great spot. But, man, it sure is nice to go out on your back porch and, and go for a swim. It's kind of like with Lance. Yeah. You don't want him because he's from Nebraska, but it sure helps. Mm. You know, but the guy knows the area, and that's great. So, um, I think Nebraska's in a good spot here for either guy. And here's the thing. This is, the, this is where Nebraska's at, where they fire Scott Frost, a, t- a quarterback of a team that used to thump Kansas, and now a step up is hiring Kansas as head coach. That's just where the program is at, and I think that's just indicative of when we talked about recalibrating expectations. 
Um, whoever they hire is going to be likely, if it's those two, one of those two would be from a program that Nebraska used to walk all over. And uh, now Nebraska's looking up at him. Well, well, Matt, there's a third name on that list from Bruce Feldman. That's the, the offensive coordinator at Alabama, Bill O'Brien. Well, what is your reaction to, to mm-hmm. Bill and his chances at this job? Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. He's... You know, was there any bigger reclamation project than having to deal with the Sandusky scandal at Penn State and the scholarship losses and trying to turn that program around? Talk about coming into a program at a bad time, a horrific time in a lot of different ways. He did it and did a great, great job. I'm always a little leery of guys who have that NFL background and pedigree. And If you succeed, are you, are you using it as a stepping stone? You, beggars can't be choosers, so it's not like Trev can go, hey – you know what would happen in five years if we if we raise the level of play and you want to leave? Well, that that'd be a great problem to have, and I, I think that would be one that Nebraska would trade for in a heartbeat. Um, I, does he have the charisma for the job? Does he have that? I I don't know. I haven't talked to Bill O'Brien in a in a while. I don't know him that well. I'm sure Trev. You know, he's at CNN when Bill O'Brien's at Georgia Tech as an assistant. Maybe they cross paths, and maybe you know through all of his connections, uh, here's good things and. You know, any guy who's good enough for good Nick Saban is good enough for Nebraska. So I, I wouldn't say that would be a bad hire. It would just be one of those. All right, let's let's see how it goes, see how he fits, and um, see what happens. One of those things. But he, if if I were making a list, he wouldn't be on my top three. But uh, I would trust Trev to to make that decision and knows more than I do about that. Matt Schick with us from ESPN Radio, ESPN TV, Sirius XM, and of course host of the Schick and Nick podcast. Find him on Twitter at ESPN underscore Schick. Matt, I know you're not in the Urban camp. Do you think Urban mm-hmm. wants to, to get back into coaching, uh, or does he like hearing his name being talked about in, <laughs> in, with the ability to get uh, a head gig again? Yeah, let's be clear. Those are two different things, aren't they? Yes. Um, I, I've been, yeah, I've been pretty vocal about, mm-hmm. you know, Nebraska's, you, Nebraska, you're better than that, you know. Um, I, I know where you get desperate sometimes, and it's like, hey, I'm looking for that special someone. I don't care if she does drugs, she'll, <laughs> we're going to get married. Like, man. She like, can I dance, that, right? I I mean, wow. That's right. That's right. Look, you know, she can cook. Yeah, but she does meth. Like, are you okay with that? Like, yeah. Hey, no, I'll be fine. It, the, the meatballs and spaghetti are outstanding. Okay, well, what happens when that wears off? And and so, like, with with Urban, it's, did you just, did you just wake up from a coma? Like, have you, have you noticed what he did in Jacksonville? How he treated people? The video of him at the bar, of him not going home with the team, of what happened at Florida, of what happened with Zach Smith at Ohio State. Like, are we just waking up? And do you want any risk of that? And is there any guarantee that Urban Meyer is ready to do heavy, heavy lifting when he's got headaches on the sideline? Like, I'm not trying to belittle any medical condition he might have, but this is going to be a heavy lift. And to say Urban Meyer is going to wave a magic wand um, was just really silly. And so the whole, yeah, Trev met with him. Oh, great. He was in town. It was very convenient mm-hmm. uh, for him to do that. And maybe that's why he fired Scott Frost so he wouldn't feel guilty about picking Urban Meyer's brain when he was in town. Who knows? But, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I think any program that wants to take a chance on Urban Meyer – uh, God bless you. Hopefully you're playing with house money. But I know one thing, Nebraska's not playing with house money. Don't cook meth, cook meatballs. That's that's the uh, <laughs> that's right. That's the that's tip. Right. Mad chick with us. Matt, take care, brother. This was fun again, and thanks for giving us a few minutes today. Anytime, fellas. Always enjoy it. The Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll time. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Back with you, Tower 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go currency. Already off to a better second hour than the uh, (laughs) 
the first hour. Chris Schmid, Mark Cranach, Elijah Herbo were efforting Brandon L. Vogel. Vogels was going to do some recon work in the southeastern part of the United States. You know, Cranach, there's no shortage of of candidates out there, and you have one that's continuing to try and uh, make a second impression. And Mickey Joseph, tough tough duty against Oklahoma last weekend. Nebraska moving forward on the recruiting trail with Mickey. Uh, that is good to have him uh, as your representative for Nebraska football with the 2023 and beyond class. And uh, Indiana looms. We've spent plenty of time talking about names and the the appeal uh, the Nebraska job has. And, and Trev Albert spent some time on that Thursday as well. And you just heard Matt Schick talk about it in the rewind because of, of the dollars, right? And uh, what you have in the Big Ten. A Big Ten job is going to be sought after. You've heard the names this week and... You know, last weekend and into the beginning of the week, you you felt like, okay, Lance Leipold was a name that continued to to gather some steam. Towards the end of the week, we had a chance to to spend time with Gary Barnett and intrigued by the the Dave Aranda name with uh, what he's doing at Baylor. Of course, Matt Campbell and and Dave Aranda hook up today in Ames for uh, an FS1 showdown. I believe that's a 2.30 kick. And uh, Baylor underdogged there. But you have familiarity with uh, Aranda and uh, Mickey and Bush. I think there was crossover. Uh, oh, in, yeah. In, no, there definitely was. There was At LSU Bush because Aranda. His, Bush was on his staff at Utah State, at Wisconsin, mm-hmm. and at LSU. So there's there's familiarity there and, and quite a bit of influence, quite honestly, mm-hmm. uh, with Aranda. We welcome in Brandon Vogel. Managing editor with HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. You can read his book with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion. And uh, we encourage you to get that. Vogue's uh, continued wacky week, right? Uh, not only with moving forward uh, on the defensive side of the ball, but uh, you have stadium improvements, a new media rights deal, upgrades to, to Memorial Stadium that need to take place. And uh, you still have a vision to sell if you're Mickey Joseph on the recruiting trail. I want to start off, though, with uh, your reaction to the amendments and the, the, the particulars on the Mickey Joseph contract here with uh, the ability to come back and keep or take your old rollback if Nebraska goes a different direction at head coach. But, I mean, that was certainly the most telling part of that, I thought. Um, and I think, you know, I, I probably shouldn't speak for everyone, but I think a lot of people have seen the value that Mickey Joseph brings. And that was true before he took on this sort of impossible task of navigating Nebraska through its remaining nine games. Um, so it, it, it'll, it'll be interesting, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Anytime you bring in a, a new head coach, there's there's certain guys you you, you hate to lose, and, and Mickey Joseph certainly belongs in that category. So this uh, makes that a little bit a little bit of an easier kind of pathway, I think, for him. Now, Brandon, I'm no expert here. Is this is this standard practice? Uh, the, the the verbiage in this contract that he's going to return back to associate head coach and, and wide receivers coach once his time as interim is up is that, is that standard or is this something new I mean how 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 deeply are we reading into this we're we reading too deeply into it um no I don't think so I'm not an expert either but it doesn't strike me as something I recall seeing a whole heck of a lot um, so I, I do think it was and you know. Maybe it's something that was important for Coach Joseph to have in there. Maybe it's something that was important for Trev Albers to put in there. Maybe both. Um, So I do think it it definitely jumps out a little bit. Um, But again, you know, I think we've we've seen the the value that that Mickey Joseph has already provided at Nebraska just as an assistant. Uh, And this is basically, I think, acknowledging that and acknowledging, hey, thanks for taking on this task. It's going to be strange for all of us. Brandon Vogel is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Brandon, you know, 
you talk a lot about we talk a lot about Nebraska's you know strengths like what are they good for right Big Ten um, great fan support um, do you think we talk enough especially in light of the new multimedia rights deal and the new Big Ten contract do you think we talk enough about how Nebraska is just flat out printing money <laughs> and does that change? Does that change the calculation a little bit here in terms of who Nebraska can realistically go after? I, I, I think it does. Um, and I, I, I think having the kind of long lead time uh, makes things, hey, let's, let's fire our best shots. And there's really no downside to doing it. I mean, you look at USC, which was on a similar timeline last year, and Lincoln Riley was the guy that was at the top, top of their list. That didn't really come together as, as far as what's been reported um, until after Oklahoma played that Oklahoma State game. And I'm sure, you know, there, he was aware of USC's interest, but it wasn't until that moment that it officially became a go and USC didn't have to move down its list. So I think the advantage of having the fan support, having the – the revenue uh, coming in continually for Nebraska and having been really, uh, you know, pretty fiscally responsible throughout all of this, throughout all the multiple coaching changes helps Nebraska in this. And that announcement, you know, Trev was asked directly about it. Does, you know, does this sort of progress given that you just entered the coaching market again help? And I, I think it does. And of course he said, Brendan Vogel joining us here, Weekend Edition, Hail Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. You know, Vogues, as we look at at some of the names that are out there, and it's been, I don't want to say exhausting, but we're just getting started, and it is, uh, it's just a different cycle, right, to to start off with, with kind of the Leipold uh, name and and wow KU's three and zero and they get Duke this weekend right. You have Iowa State and Campbell. He's been proven to uh, to be a winner and a, and a developer. Let's spend some time on Aranda, okay? And and I want to uh, continue to go there. W- what's most impressive to you about Aranda? Is it his stops and success? And tell me what you think about the Baylor job, not only what he's done, but just the job in general in Waco. How how tough or easy is it, in your opinion, to win down there? Uh, a, a lot easier than when Nebraska used to play the Bears regularly. Uh, I think we all, <laughs> we're all aware of that. Um, you know, that was a job that was like – uh, there weren't a lot of power jobs that were probably lower than that one, you know, in the big – well, when Nebraska was in the Big 12, Art Bryles <laughs> kind of shows what it can be. Matt Rule comes in and does a good job over a short span. And now Aranda has. So, and we've seen, you know, the brand new stadium that got great facilities because it seems like everybody does at this point. Um, so it's a good job. I mean, I think, the, you know, one of the real interesting pieces of this for Nebraska and, you know, any other team in the SEC or Big Ten who might end up in this position is like we are headed somewhere where I think everybody kind of acknowledges and assumes that we're not talking so much Power Five anymore as Power Two, and that's the Big Ten and the SEC. So does that open up some doors for you? We don't know yet. I mean, it's this is literally our first crack at it, really. Of is an SEC Big Ten job more secure, more desirable, more lucrative? than almost anything, you know, all but the best teams in the Pac-12, Big 12, or ACC can offer. So there's a piece of that as well. I think the most, uh, to talk at Randa for a second, I think the most interesting or impressive thing to me is just kind of the level approach. I mean, the guy has coached defense at a high, high level as a coordinator first, and it's translated to Baylor. Um, that's the thing you always worry about with a, with a coordinator is, okay, now you got to run the whole show. Can you do it? And, and so far he has. Um, it's kind of a nature of coaching, hiring, and firing in this age where the sample sizes are often pretty small, and that gives me a little bit of hesitation. But really there's not a lot of guys out there that wouldn't give you that hesitation because it just all happens so quickly now. 
Brandon Vogel Brandon with Vogel. us here. Go for it, Mark. Ah, sorry. Uh, I should have. I should have. We, we, we should have the play cards this week. <laughs> I know. We, yeah, we totally blew that. Brandon, what do you think is more likely? Is it that Nebraska will land a coach from, I guess, kind of the the obvious candidate pool, which I would classify as Leipold, Aranda, and Matt Campbell, or is it somebody nobody's even talking about at all? Um, <laughs> we're we're going to have a long enough lead up to this that by the time I think Nebraska announces the hire, I don't know if there will be anybody that nobody's talked about, but I wouldn't rule that out. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of people out there that I mean, the way these these, these kind of coaching lists all go, and we all do them, is you know you kind of connect the dots that are really easy to connect. Part of the reason we're doing this so early is to give yourself time to to look beyond that. Um, you know, I was a little bit ashamed of myself until hearing Bronco Mendenhall talk about the Nebraska job a bit this week. And, you know, his numbers are, are very good. He's interesting in that he, you know, family is really important to him. He and his family basically decided we're going to take a break. Like I'm going to coach again, but I'm just going to leave this Virginia job because I think we need to. And he's somebody who's just like, sitting there you know if, if nebraska decided he was the guy they could theoretically hire him tomorrow and let him get going on 2023 so i think that's i think candidates like that are certainly still possible for nebraska now career record by the way 135 and 81 hmm. if anybody's wondering that's all no that's it a couple uh, 11 no comment seasons required. of byu in there yeah yeah just pointing that out. Now, Brandon, seven and seven and bulls. Brandon, from what you know here about Trev Alberts, I don't think you have any inside information, but from what you know about Trev and, and what he wants to accomplish in this coaching search, how much do you think he's going to rely upon that search firm? I know coaching search firms have drawn some ire from fans in the past, but uh, their convenience and, and what they allow you to do in, in a coaching search really does open up some new opportunities. So how much do you think he's going to rely upon that, that coaching search firm uh, as he goes through this process? I, I think you. I think you rely on them as much as as much as to the point that you feel comfortable, which I think can be quite a bit. Um, I mean, CSA has a pretty solid track record. Um, had a hand in the Lincoln Riley. I mean, what you're really, I think, looking for here is kind of what we were just talking about: is those coaches that are not, you know. Lance Leifold, Matt Campbell, people, somebody that everyone's kind of talking about and everyone kind of draws the natural connections there. You hire a search firm to be like, okay, yep, we see that. Uh, we, and we can kind of infer from, from those candidates, if they're high on your list, what you're looking for. Here's some guys you might not be thinking about. And that's where I think they come in, and then it becomes how far down your list do you have to go before you can get a coach that, that wants the job. Brandon Vogel is with us here. Weekend edition, Hale Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. Vogues, you've seen a lot of coaching searches. You've seen a lot of lists during the carousel season, and it, and it gets started early with Nebraska, with Arizona State. What's your take on 2022 so far with the names mentioned? Is this as strong of a year as there's been, not from a, a suitor standpoint, but from an options back to your point about that reality that the SEC and the Big Ten are, are the two landing spots, it feels like right now for the future of college football for Monster Payday and just kind of being the, the, the premier options in college football. Nothing against other leagues, but you just see how things are drifting with, with realignment. Do you like the names that, that might be in Invisible Inc. on Trev's list. Yeah, I mean, if that, if that ends up kind of transpiring over multiple years and this is, you know, the first we see of it, um, then, yeah, it does feel like a pretty strong candidate pool. Um, if, if, it's, if it's too early to kind of see the influence of, hey, we think this is headed to the SEC and the Big Ten are just going to have huge advantages beyond just the money, which they already have, over, you know, other really good jobs. Um, 
then then I think this the coaching pool, so to speak, is you know fairly typical or fairly standard. I mean, you look at this, and I, you know I think Alberts was asked about that this week as well. You kind of have to freeze these coaches in amber a little bit mm-hmm. because. You're not hiring them. Like, if Kansas goes 10-2, and two, great. It'd probably be harder to get Leipold if he's your top guy then. Um, but really, you know, you're hiring him based on what he did at Wisconsin-Whitewater and what he did at Buffalo and what he's already done at Kansas. So, we'll see. I guess the, the thing that would make me very nervous is if we're, there's, there's somebody who becomes the hottest name throughout this, through this 2022 season – and that ends up being, you know, what Nebraska goes with, then then I get really worried about just kind of sample size, uh, you know, one special season, and and maybe that's it. Brandon Vogel with us on Hale Varsity Radio. And, by the way, uh, Bronco Mendenhall, his three sons' names are Raider, Breaker, and Cutter. Football guy. Um, Football guy. Yeah, let's, go ahead and, let's go ahead and sign him up. Uh, so – Let's go back to the actual product on the field that Nebraska is dealing with right now. And Brandon, what's it, were you equally alarmed, I guess, as I was, and I believe Chris and Elijah were at, I mean, it's not so much alignment and uh, what play calls you're doing and all that, but just like the mentality of what you saw on defense, especially on that long quarterback run. It just doesn't look like guys are – there's a handful of guys playing that are just sort of waiting for somebody else to make the play. Was that your takeaway too? Yeah, that <laughs> that run is, is, is not one that uh, anyone will remember fondly. I didn't think very fondly of it in the moment. It was just, it was just strange. <laughs> it felt like it took like 60 seconds to, to, to go those, those 61 yards and – you had some missed tackles. You had at the end just like not great effort, and and yeah. you had a couple of mistakes to to even put it in, you know, that kind of territory where it was going to go sixty one yards. And it's the thing that it start with it was third and seven. Like you just got to get off the field, and that's been a problem for Nebraska through all four games. Um, you got to get off the field on third and seven more often than the Huskers have. So there, there was just nothing, nothing good about that. Not how it started, not how it unfolded in the middle, and then I particularly didn't like how it finished for a couple of Huskers there. So got to get that figured out during the bye week. I mean, the way forward here for Nebraska is if they're going to slow it down on offense, I think that's okay. I think they can do that. The efficiency numbers are good. Uh, you just got to get a defense that – it's look, they're not going to become 2009 Nebraska during the spy week. I think we all know that, yeah. but just get off the field when you have an advantage. If you can do those two things, you probably got a shot in most, well, say six or seven of the eight remaining games against anyone. Well, Brandon, when I look at that play, it was poor fundamentals from tackling to, to, to poor rush lanes uh, from your defensive line. It was poor situational awareness, uh, knowing it's third and seven. And, and what play calls the offense probably has up their sleeve. And then it's also uh, just poor effort all around from the defense. And with those three things in mind, it almost feels like that play is the perfect representation of the Husker defense's play through, through the first four games of the season. And what, what do you think they need to do moving forward for, for that to not be a, a perfect representation of what this season's going to be as a whole for the defense? Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, it, it was a, a lack of kind of fundamentals, which is, which is troubling. They've got they've got some new guys, um, but you know I think one of Mark's comments of like you just got so being inexperienced is one thing, but if that inexperience shows up in, in guys being like oh I thought you had it, uh, that's a problem too. So Bill Bush is you know we know what kind of personality he is uh, his approach to things very enthusiastic. I think you just need to to see the effort because. It's, it's hard to get a whole lot better in season, in my opinion, but you can play harder, and I think that's where it starts. What, what's realistic, Vogues, for this defense with the bye week? You, you said how much better can you get? Effort, yes. Do you anticipate Nebraska going young, and, and could it go the other way? 
and get worse because of inexperience. Yeah, that's always a, a danger. You know, I always give coaching staff the benefit of the doubt on that. Um, it's easy to be like, well, this isn't, you know, this position isn't working out. Why isn't anybody else playing? Um, I always, I'm, I'm hesitant to get there because it's like, well, these coaches see them every day. It's not like coaches are infallible, um, but they should have a pretty decent idea of what guys can and can't do. But I think Nebraska's in a spot under an interim head coach with, you know, two really big coaching changes already. Um, it's like, let's, let's try anything. Um, and if you've got guys who are going to come in and, and make mistakes, but make them at 100 miles an hour, as they say, uh, I think you take that. Um, entering Big Ten play, you know, the Oklahoma's offense is going to be pretty good. Georgia Southern's was uh, shockingly good with, with some help from, from Nebraska. And even Northwestern, even though <laughs> they have that, that loss looks worse and worse as the Wildcats continue to play, um, they're, they're better offensively than I thought they would have would have been so here in nebraska i think a realistic goal is like get this back down to about 28 points a game that would make you from a scoring perspective basically average and if you can get there or even get close get it under 30 let's put it that way i think nebraska has an offense that if it starts clicking a little bit could could win some games that way vogues before we let you get out What's uh, your college football Saturday look like? Uh, how are you going to enjoy your bye? Well, I'm uh, at the zoo right now with the <laughs> with the young ones, so that'll be the start of it. Probably won't uh, settle in until until the afternoon games. But pretty interested in Florida, Tennessee. Pretty, really interested in App State, James Madison, uh, Oklahoma, K State will be a game I keep a close eye on, and then. Pac-12 uh, kind of leads the way, I think, this week with uh, that USC trip to Oregon State. Super interesting. Um, and then Utah-Arizona State. I'm interested to see what the Sun Devils do in their first game uh, under an interim head coach. So it'll be a pretty full day once we, uh, once we see these drafts. Brandon, more important question, what is your favorite animal to see at the zoo? <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I, it, it's tough. It's tough to beat the big cat. Oh, um, that's that's always my that's always my go to. So, um, and elephants. Elephants are a close second. That, they're the, they're the Georgia and Alabama, I guess, of this, which you know, fitting enough. If uh, at least on the Alabama side. Okay, so the giraffe is what college football team? The giraffe <laughs> is. Hmm, that's a good question. <sighs> they're probably whatever, they're kicking around. Merton, in what college like did Merton 15. Hanks play for? <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. Like, I, yeah, <laughs> the, uh, the drafts are somewhere in the fi- fifteen to twenty range. So, you know, right now, I guess that makes um, uh, Texas A and M maybe. <laughs> I don't know. That works. Well, you and the little man have fun at the zoo and, and, and uh, be aware of the peacocks. <laughs> Will do. Have a good one, guys. <laughs> there he is, Brandon Vogel, uh, dad of the year. Love that, man. Have I ever told you guys the story about the time I, I saw a real-life giraffe in the wild, went on a safari in Africa, and there was a, a, like a giraffe over the trees? It was crazy. No, he just kind of kicking it. No, oh, there's Elijah. Did you wave at him? I have a picture. I, wa- I kind of waved. Like, it's just one of those things, like, you don't realize, like, when you see him in a zoo, you're like, wow, that thing's tall. It's got a big old right. neck. But then you see it in the wild, and you go, wow, that thing just looks really out of place and, like, majestic. It was just pretty incredible. The hmm. giraffes at the Lincoln Zoo are incredible. My, uh, we, I got to feed Phoebe when she was born. Mm, yeah. uh, we got we, uh, have we reached this point in the season? <laughs> we were talking about giraffes. Well, it's bye week. <laughs> <laughs> That's... You know, it's week four, week five, and uh-huh. we're on to animals. You know, like uh-huh. I, I can't. I, I agree with it. I think it's a better topic than that freaking defense we saw last week. <laughs> <laughs> God. Zoo animals on the next hail varsity. God, quick timeout. The couple raptors or big cats to play defense. Something. 
Sure. Something that pursues and finishes. You know? <laughs> Explosiveness is what Cranach wants. God. That that uh, predator men, that predator mentality. Closing speed. Yes, right. Uh, able to uh, to adjust on the fly and and be uh, athletic. Now we can. Yeah, we can go. You down ever seen a lion too. miss a tackle? I mean, come on. <laughs> no. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> they sink their claws in and they bring that pre- or that prey to the ground. Right. That's what they do. Yes. The, Perfect form the gaz- every time. The gazelle's yeah. done. All right? That's your like that's your, your tackle for loss. Uh, we'll spend time with the Iron Horse, keeping the animal theme going. Gary Sharp will <laughs> join us. Hail Varsity continues weekend. We're presented by Currency. Glad to have you back. Yes, sir. You heard me right. Here are the guys, Schmidt and Cranach. Well, Hector, here's the game plan. We're going to bring us two absolute martinis. You know how I like them straight up. And then precisely seven and one half minutes after that, you're going to bring us two more. And then two more after that every five minutes until one of us passes out. Excellent strategy, sir. Well, they are getting after it uh, for Maryland and uh, Michigan. The Twitter video this morning, my goodness, some gal uh, in a tank top uh, getting a full beer option pitched her way, making a great right-handed catch, smashes said beer on forehead, and then proceeds to slam it. Iowa Russ sending the poster of the day. Uh, It's titled, Punting is Winning. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Rutgers v. <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> Taylor like versus Corsack, the thunder from down under, mate. Yeah. And yeah, it says, like, get punt struck. Looks like a, uh, looks like a boxing got, poster. It is. Magic it looks like a boxing. Punters. It's yeah. pretty good. Their legs intertwined. Uh, when we talk hang time, uh, that's been one positive for Nebraska football. Uh, I, I guess you can lean on. We welcome in the Iron Horse, Gary Sharp. Sharpie, how are you doing, bud? How you spending your bye? Thanks for the time. Uh, hey, thanks, guys. I imagine uh, that's Urban Meyer's trip back to Ann Arbor. There will be some posters that will be uh, very unkind to Urban Meyer. I mean, I, I think if you thought the little incident in the steakhouse went away, I'm sure you'll see that front and center on Fox here in about uh, 30 minutes. Yeah, we had to talk to Junior, keeping with the poster theme. Uh, Junior was getting advice from some of uh, his his friends that are, you know, girls, uh, because he asked out Emma to to homecoming, and and he had a good homecoming last night. But he was talking to one of his, his gal friends in, I don't know if it was math or science, but uh, his his little gal plays soccer, and Carson made some sort of, or was going to go with some sort of scoring sign reference, and I said, no, <laughs> no, no, uh, <laughs> we, we can't do that. <laughs> well, why? Hey, Gary, so, well, Gary, we, we, you know, it's reached that point of the season. Brandon Vogel was at the zoo just now we talking, and, and we brought up like what's your favorite animal uh because you know, we, we all it, want to be here this morning none of us are hung over it, it helps us avoid the, the topics at hand here so a favorite animal at the zoo uh i would say penguin i've always been a big fan of the penguin i see i i think they're overrated i i wow. a lot of people like penguins you know can but you please, like what can you please explain yourself on that horrible take well i Look at these. They're just kind of like, I don't know. They're, they're like just these big cylinders with these little weak legs. <laughs> you know, they're black and white. They don't blend into anything. They're good swimmers, but it's like you're a bird, dude. You're supposed to fly. Or they're birds, right? I mean, come on. I don't know. They're, they're fine. They're fine. Wow. Somebody, somebody didn't grow up with the movie Happy Feet, I can tell. Yeah, I just, you know, I don't mind. My dad likes penguins. I, I don't dislike penguins, but I'm just saying of all the animals, mm. you're going with that one. And it's just kind of like, eh, eh. I'll go like leopard. Okay, right? Sharpie. What like what that. zoo animal is Nebraska? Ooh, uh, that's a great question. I would say that they are the uh, something extinct. Uh, well, <laughs> it was cooler twenty years ago than it is now. <laughs> They, they are uh, they are an animal that is not extinct, but uh, you don't see much of. <laughs> yeah, a rhino. They're a rhino. Well, but a rhino is pretty tough and physical, and 
Actually, rhinos can be smart at times. That's true. Nebraska's a hippo. Well, no, Nebraska, is, Nebraska right now is kind of wandering. Um, mm. So maybe there are any, any animal you want to pick that's kind of out in the desert that they have a destination, they're just not really sure how to get there. Polar bear floating out there on an ice cap as their world around them collapses. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Hey, that, that, that thing that the uh, polar bear is sitting on uh, doesn't have much left on it. It has pretty much melted all the way. Mm. Yeah. Gary is, Sharp with us. Sharpie, good. what's your big board look like from a coaching standpoint? I know Mickey's contract details released yesterday, but there's been plenty of names out there. Any any name that's high on your list or, or you like? Well, I've always liked and this was before, you know, things got sideways in Nebraska mm-hmm. a couple you know, starting a couple of years ago. I've always been a big fan of Matt Campbell. I think who he is, how he built his program. Um, I like guys that grind, that have worked their way up through Division Three to FB, FCS, FBS, um, you know, Group of Five, the Power Five. Um, people that have won everywhere they've been because they're builders and they're innovative and they're aggressive and they think outside of the box. So I've always been attracted to Matt Campbell. And he's, he's rightfully, he should be on everybody's list. But remember, he's very choosy because He's got a good setup in Ames, and I think there are things that we probably overlook in a wild coaching search that are important to a guy like Matt Campbell or Lance Leipold or, or Dave Aranda, three of the, the top candidates. I will tell you, I like defensive guys. So Jim Leonard is a guy that I really, really like, but the problem is Jim Leonard has never been a head coach, and he may have been, you know, for some of these coaches that have less experience, they may be a frosted. You know, Frost only had two years of head coaching experience. But I, but I think as we all have these big boards, and I'm there, I haven't, guys, in, in, in two weeks into this, I haven't gotten into, here's my big board. There are coaches that I'm attracted to, like the three I mentioned. Mm-hmm. I think a guy like Pat Fitzgerald in a different environment like Nebraska, that might mm-hmm. be an interesting thing. But here's, here's the thing that I'm, I'm telling people is, if you listen to some of the stuff that Trev says, he described why they got into their agreement with Fi Sports, and he was talking about their CEO. He said he's innovative, he's aggressive, and he's a different type of thinker. And while I'm listening to that, and I've listened to Trev speak a lot, I'm thinking, man, he just kind of told you without telling you some elements of a new coach that he's looking for. I still think through this all, and it's going to get real quiet here because now they're going to get deep into the search and – you have a search firm that may unearth a surprising guy or two that you would not assume that all of a sudden is interested in Nebraska. And so there might be a surprising pick that pops up onto the radar. But also, I've known this, we've all been through coaching searches. It is sometimes the least talked about person that ends up getting the job. Well, yeah, that's happened twice, right? Like Riley mm-hmm. came out of nowhere, Callahan came out of nowhere. There, and then, you know, Pelini and Frost were like the obvious ones that everybody wanted. Um, so you never know. What about some of the coaches that are on the sidelines right now? A Chris Peterson, a Patterson, a Bronco Mendenhall, dare I say Jim Tressel. <laughs> Just, you know, like any of those guys do you think are viable? Um, if they still have the the fire, uh, if they if they, you know, um, want to get into this fishbowl that is Nebraska? Yes. I, I think right now everybody is on the table. You know, there's been this huge, you know, the, this has been the week of let's, let's go at each other about Urban Meyer. I think at this point Nebraska is in a situation where they have their standards, and there's one thing about Trev is he will not back away from his beliefs. He will not let somebody influence on what he wants to do. Um, so, you know, he knows that when he's out there selling it, this is a major – sell. I mean, this is a lift. It's not the kind of lift that you have at Kansas or, or other places that are downtrodden that in two years got it up. I mean, this is a fairly significant lift, but not as heavy as then. Um, I, I think he'll go out and he'll be, a, he'll be aggressive to try and find you know, that, that right person. Um, but again, I, I, I think we might find a surprising person. But here, here's the thing through all of this. is This is the first time, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you guys disagree, that's fine. You trust the guy that is going out to make the hire. Now, Moose, we knew who he had to go hire, so you take him out of the equation. But the past athletic directors that had to make a major hire, and this is the, 
you know, this is kind of the significant hire during this whole cycle of 20 years. You trust the guy to sell it, he knows it, and he's going to get it done because he realizes how important this is. I have high level of trust in, in Trev. I know we've said that the last several years when we've reacted to, to candidates that have been hired. I thought T.O. hiring Bo made the right call there. You know, I know Bo wasn't perfect, but nine wins, ten wins looks really good if you're a Nebraska fan right now. Despite some big stage embarrassments, you were consistent. You weren't losing to other teams in, in your division all that often. Uh, and, and who knows if you would have got over the hump in some bigger games. But I think Trev's, Trev's a guy that I think – and some folks may disagree, Sharpie, but I think Trev, I, I think a guy like Moose, his ego wanted to be the guy that hired a guy like Frost. I got that done. And while I don't think Trev's immune from ego, I think it is core. I think Trev wants to, to get it right for the program, not because I want to get it right because I'm Trev Alberts and it's a, you know the legacy thing. I think Trev's intentions are to get a program he loves back on track and make the best hire that way. His motive seems pretty genuine to me. Yeah, and here's the other thing. During this coaching search, guys, and we've all been through it, Trev will not let anybody else get involved. Like, Trev is not a puppet. He's not going to – there's not going to be people that are around him or above him that he's going to let influence who he's going to get. If he wants somebody – and I, I believe he's got three to six candidates that he likes that he's attracted to um that he will search out and that list may go to maybe eight or ten but he won't let somebody else say hey you got to hire this guy and then we're going to move the strings he'll do this this is his pick and i think that's refreshing because he's in a unique spot he studied the program currently as it is he studied the landscape and he knows what nebraska needs to move forward in the new big 10 so he's in a unique spot and he's also got He's got an abundance of money, guys. He's got a brand-new facility uh, to sell. So there's a lot of advantages here. Um, and whatever job comes open, unless there's just something crazy that opens up, Nebraska's going to be the best job during this cycle. It's just how many people are attracted to Nebraska with everything that comes with it. Not just the, hey, if you get it to pop and win. It's everybody that is around the program, that supports the program, and the challenges you've had in the past. Who is the person that says, I can be the guy to fix that? and take care of what has ailed this program for two decades. Talking with Gary Sharp here on a Saturday morning edition of Hale Varsity Radio. And Gary, we got about three minutes left here uh, before we got to get out. And I just want to ask you, what, what is crunch time going to be for Trev Alberts here in this hiring? Uh, you, you expect that, that this is going to take a little bit and it's not going to be a new head coach announced until after the season. But when's he going to have to lock into the nitty gritty and get himself a, a list of you know a top two or three that he can start negotiations with? When is crunch time going to be? Well, I think it's going to be a slow process. I mean, you don't have to hire a coach on September 24th. You do have some time. But as you get closer to the end of November and you have to make some decisions and there's going to, guys going to be leaving on your roster and there's going to be the portal and there's going to be recruiting and stuff, that's when it will really ramp up. So I think now he digs deep into it. You know, what was announced earlier this week is a big deal for Nebraska. I mean, it's monumental. They're basically changing Memorial Stadium. Um, a hundred-year facility, so that's a, that's where it's taken a lot of his attention. Now they'll start to get into the process of okay, let's identify some candidates, let's talk to some agents, and let's see where we go. But he's in a good spot, guys, because I think he can sit back. He doesn't have to hire Lance Leipold today. He doesn't have to hire whoever wins between Iowa State and Baylor. He can sit back and watch some things and listen, and then also don't forget last year the sitting coach at Notre Dame and the sitting coach at Oklahoma changed jobs. Strange things happen. Somebody may pop up privately onto the radar that you would not expect that then all of a sudden, because you've been patient, you have the opportunity to talk to that person. So I expect over the next six weeks, guys, there will be all of the the coaching rumors and searches and boards and all that stuff. But from Nebraska's perspective, I believe it will get really, really quiet, and it should, until they get closer to making a decision, which I think you'll really see it ramp up about – mid-November, if it's not the guy that has proven that is currently there, that he's also in the mix, and that being Ethan Joseph. Gary Sharp with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Hey, quick, before we get you out of here, um, Nebraska and UNO fall baseball today. Are, are you on site for that one? 
I am uh, not on site for that. But how cool is that? Uh, you know, uh, Nebraska's been kicked out of Haymarket Park because they're redoing the field. But they're going to play 14 innings. I mean, it's weird how we get into the season and we count down for so long during the summer when all of us are back. And the season starts and you're like, oh, wow, we only have – Eight more games left. Mm-hmm. Fall baseball starting. Basketball practice starts on on Monday. But I think it's pretty cool. I, you know, I think all three Division One baseball programs kind of take care of each other, and they made the NCAA tournament all in the same year at nineteen. Um, but I think they'll have a good crowd. The weather's going to be nice. I mean, heck, it was a hundred midweek, and then it was like you know all of a sudden fall when you snapped your fingers. So it's pretty cool. But this is a you talk about you talk about the interesting athletic year for Nebraska. They've already made a move on football. <laughs> You don't know what's going to happen with basketball. And remember, Bill or uh, Will Bolt completely turned over his roster, unprecedented what he did with his roster. And so I'm curious to see how all of those parts mesh together. It's Gary Sharp with us. Sharp, you have yourself a weekend, buddy. We'll check in next time. Thank you so much. Hey, hey thanks, guys. There he is, Gary Sharp with us. Get the podcast, Hail Varsity Radio, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and the Hail Varsity YouTube channel. Cranack, have yourself a weekend. Thanks for popping in this morning. Yeah, y'all upgrade your animal choices from Penguin. <laughs> Come on. Let's go with the big Brennan big says friend. Flamingo. Lucky to have a leg to stand on. <laughs> uh, well played. Elijah, be good, buddy. Appreciate you. Chris Schmidt, back at you Monday at 4 with Hail Varsity.